There is a way There is a way There is a way And uh, this event is uh, one of those times where you realize there's a lot of great Americans out there who have contributed a lot to our nation and continue to do it even today, so thank you. Um, I read the bio today. I don't know if many of you did that, but uh, Brian, wow. <laughs> uh, and I'm just going to give you a few highlights. Uh, Brian uh, graduated from East Carolina University in 1970. I remember that year. Uh, unfortunately, I graduated the same year with a degree in history, yay, uh, in anthropology for the next, and then for the next 20 years, served in the United States Air Force as a fighter pilot. And during the Vietnam War, he flew 212 close air support missions and was shot down near the Canadian, uh, Cambodian border. He was unable to eject and forced to ride the plane into the jungle. Wild ride. Uh, severely burned in ensuing crash and he was given up for dead at that particular point. Rescued by special forces, good for the Army, uh, Brian endured one year in a military hospital where he underwent 15 surgical procedures and told he would never fly again. But as uh, human will over doctor's advice, after much physical therapy, Brian miraculously returned to active duty flying, flew the A-7, was an instructor in the A-10, which is still flying today, and went on to teach at the Air Force's Top Gun School. Culminated in Air Force career by flying the nation's top secret spy plane, the SR-71 Blackbird, fastest aircraft ever built, even today. Brian flew covert missions in the Blackbird for four years and was a pilot who provided President Reagan with details photos of the Libyan terrorist camps in 1986. During that time, he became the only SR-71 pilot in history to fly three missions in three consecutive days. And if you know a little bit about what the SR-71 does to your body, since it's flying so fast, that's uh, quite a feat. After retiring from the Air Force in 1990, he pursued writing, photography, and was the first pilot to write a book about flying the Blackbird, com completely illustrated with his own photography. He's also the only man to fly extensively with the Navy Blue Angels and the Air Force Thunderbirds as a photojournalist. So I just think going through that, it just serves, serves a life well served and continue to serve. So as a perfect veteran celebration of a speaker that can tell you about what the Air Force had done and what a lot of people have done to serve our nation. So with uh, honor, I'd like to introduce you uh, Air Force hero, Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much. When I was first asked to come here, I envisioned a couple of old men in white lab coats and people. <laughs> it's so nice to see there's humanoids behind the gate. What a treat. Uh, I'm used to working in top secret facilities and also didn't scare me getting in the badge and everything today. But what a pleasure to come and uh, be invited. I know, what, I know what a lot of you are thinking right now. How could a fighter pilot possibly be a keynote speaker? They have a limited vocabulary. <laughs> we talk in words like jet, zoom, fly. Occasionally a larger word like tower, runway. I want you to know that I've been doing this for 25 years now and I've worked extensively on my vocabulary. <laughs> you will be hearing some words in today's presentation that are very, very Big. <laughs> I don't want you to confuse me with anyone that's heroic or famous or did anything great. It's good etiquette when you check the airplane out of the squadron to bring it back. Uh, leaving your jet in the jungle doesn't qualify you as heroic. I am a survivor. Uh, they say a good landing is one you can walk away from. A really great landing is when you can use the airplane again. Uh, <laughs> I did not do either of those things. I want you to know that what you are looking at here today is the luckiest person that you will ever see at this podium, ever. And at the end of today's presentation, I think you will agree with me on that. 
Now I will admit to you I did not feel like the luckiest guy on earth when my aircraft was going down. I couldn't get out. It was, it was a horrendous morning. Everything was going wrong. And I was about to impact the jungle and I realized I was about to die in a matter of seconds. It was a very sobering thought. I uh, clenched my eyes tightly and clenched my fist. I figured it'll all be over in a heartbeat. I'll wake up in heaven painlessly be over. Next thing I remember was a great deal of fire and smoke and heat and flames all around me. And I thought, well, maybe I didn't go the way I <laughs> thought I would. <laughs> Quickly realizing I was still alive, I got out of the airplane and collapsed in the jungle. I was severely burned. I was numb. I was not in any great pain. I just, I just realized I couldn't, I couldn't use my hands. They were, I was just really badly burned. And I laid there. And if you want heroes in my story, it is the Special Forces people that came and got me. And they eventually got me back to... It was kind of, a, it's not like in the movies where everybody's anxious to rescue you. Uh, the first chopper said, that's too far, we're out of gas. The next guy said, that's not our sector, we can't be near Cambodia. And finally, the third guy was Army. And, you know, as most of you know, you can talk Army people to just about anything if you try. <laughs> and we got him down there, and uh, he got down there, and I'm listening to all this on the radio. I'm just laying there, and, and they're, they're hovering over me at their weapons, and they're shooting in the background, and they're, they're, they're talking to this guy. And, and he says, I can't put it down. There's not enough rotor clearance. I'll lose my crew. It, this is, uh, and, and I'm thinking, wow, what more could go wrong today? And at that moment, this man that was kind of guarding over me pointed his M16 at the chopper and very clearly on the radio said, you either put it down or we'll shoot it down. <laughs> and I thought at that moment, I am on the right team of players. <laughs> Next thing we heard was, I think we can put it down which he never did in a superior bit of airmanship. He could not land. He hovered four feet above the ground and they stuffed me in there and it got me back to Thailand and they said, well, he's not going to make the trip across the Pacific. Send him to Okinawa, send him to Kadena. He'll die, put his body in a box, ship it home. And that's the harsh reality of that war. Well, they shipped a team of nine people from Fort Sam Houston, Texas, Burn Center, all the way to Okinawa just for me. And their mission in life was see if you could save the young lieutenant. Bad thing happened to me in those two months of intensive care. The numbness wore off. I'd like to tell you all about how courageous, brave, and heroic I was going through all that treatment and tough. It'd be a big fat lie. I'm an inspirational speaker today. I go all over the world and it pains me to tell you that I wanted to give up and that it, it was just so beyond what I could deal with that I, I pray at night, please God, we have the wrong guy. Let me just die and it would be easier. And it's hard for me to even believe I, I did that. And I used to lay there thinking of all the bad things I'd ever done in my entire life. That took a week. <laughs> all right, two weeks. <laughs> and it still didn't add up, and I couldn't cope, and my body was wasting away. I, I, I was in such incredible shape when I went down. I was in physically fast, 180 pounds of just muscle and steel, at, well, as you see today. And uh, my body went down to 119. 119, and I, it wasn't receiving food. It just, it just said, I, we can't eat. It's just failing. And they said, you know, your body saved you, and now you have to build it back, and you have to get food. And I, I said, it's not, I can't put food down. It's just not working. They said, if you lose another pound, you're, you're, we can't save you. And I, w I didn't care at that point. I said, well, okay, then I guess I'm just going to have to die after all this incredible pain for two months. And there has to be a turning point to every story, of course. Mine was kind of a silly <laughs> thing, except I, it wasn't silly to me. And I will share it with you today. When I was laying there one afternoon, I could see out the third floor window, the soccer field, the end of the runway at Kadena, the, the road there, and I could hear the kids playing soccer every afternoon, laughing and playing, kicking the ball. It was April. And I thought, boy, I was those kids. I'd give anything to be back out there with them. And that made me sad. And at that moment, Judy Garland came on the radio singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. How many of you know the words to that song? Anybody here? No, you don't. Put your hands down. You think you know the words to that song. I thought I did from the Wizard of Oz, Yellow Brick Road. No, no. That is a very deep philosophical adult song. You listen to the words to that song. It's all about daring to dream. It's about dreams really coming true. I heard the words of that song for the first time that day. They penetrated my brain sharper than any scalpel they were using. And I could look out the window and see the other side of the rainbow and those kids. And I made a choice, made a decision right then. I am going to try to eat the food tomorrow. I want to live. I'm going to try to survive. I'll never fly again. I'll never do anything. I'll probably lose a couple fingers and I probably won't walk right again. It doesn't matter. 
I am going to change my attitude and, then, and tomorrow I'm going to start trying to, to heal. And isn't it amazing how the simplest change of attitude in life can affect the whole rest of your life? That one choice. The next day they came in, they had the food, they could see a different look on my face, they could see fire in my eyes, which is probably a bad pun at this point. And they were excited and I tried to eat and it wouldn't go down. My body rejected it and I could not eat. They were beside themselves. They could see I was trying and I'm saying, no, God, please, just forget everything I just said up for two months. I'm, I want to eat now. Let it go down. Nothing. Finally, some Mormon corpsman had a sack lunch. His wife had packed him. He said, this, is, this didn't come from the hospital. It's different. Maybe there's something in here he could eat. Anything. It's nothing. Except a little plastic container of cherry Kool-Aid. And the cherry Kool-Aid went down real good. They ran to the commissary and got every pack of cherry Kool-Aid they could find. I drank 3.2 gallons of cherry Kool-Aid the first day. Ladies and gentlemen, I lived on cherry Kool-Aid for four straight days, drinking an average of five gallons a day. And I peed real good. <laughs> and they said that's even a better sign. His body's functioning normally internally. He doesn't need anything internally. He's just got to build his body back. Eventually, some saltine crackers, some bread. Next thing you know, I'm on a plane back to the States. Where I spent a whole year in the hospital. And they did all kinds of surgery. And they said, well, I guess we won't cut those fingers off. Maybe we could save them. You'll never fly again, though. Keep that in mind. You'd be lucky to just be alive. Well, back in the deep uh, recesses of my brain, I needed to think I could still fly again to go through all the therapy. I had to have a goal. I, I realized the power in the mind. was far greater than the failing muscles of your body. Spent a year there and one day, I'm not going to bore you with that whole tale of adventure, make you sick, boom, I pop out of the hospital and more miraculously I'd passed a flight physical. They couldn't flunk me. They said internally he's strong as nails. He just, he looks like hell on the outside, but <laughs> the scar tissue, if he keeps working it, he, he, he's got dexterity, I, I, we can't flunk him. Got out of the hospital and went back to the Air Force. The Air Force wasn't all that excited to have me. They're going like, well, you, you crashed one of our jets already. No, they, they didn't say that. They didn't know what to do with me. And here's something you've already learned in life, I'm sure. There are many no people in the world who want to explain to you why you can't do something. Many people who are too afraid to do their life. Fear rules all their decisions. I don't want to look bad. I'm probably not very good at it. I might fail. People might laugh at me. All the reasons that stop people from living their dream. I didn't have that problem. You lay on your back for a year, you will learn what's important in life. And you will have no fear because you're not going to miss another moment of it. So when I returned, I had two major concepts in my brain that I will share with you today. One... Life is short and it's uncertain. It's not one or the other, it's both. And because it is, you can't possibly miss the gift that each day is. Number two, pursue your passion now. Do it now. Do the thing in life you love, whether it's family, work, job, hobby, whatever it is, don't wait because of rule number one. Armed with this very simplistic bit of knowledge, I went back in the Air Force and I felt like I was a two-year-old. I was born again. I was like starting over. I'd had a whole year in the hospital and it was like I was fearless and I wasn't going to miss anything and I was like two. Now it makes the Air Force very nervous to have two-year-olds flying their, their jets. <laughs> they either loved me or hated me. I was an enigma. It was like this is the greatest guy we had in the squad and he'll try anything. He'll volunteer. He's fearless and he, he's got a great attitude. Or he is a loose cannon. We don't know what he's going to do next. I got back to flying and I, I became a big story in the Air Force, which I didn't want. I, fame and, and being in a magazine, it wasn't, that wasn't comfortable. 
people then all thought, well, they knew you. And they, they're all looking at you funny and like, well, so what does the scar tissue feel? You know, it's like, I just want to do my job. And I did my job very well. And I, I was teaching at Top Gun. And one day I, I said, I'd like to fly the world's fastest jet, SR-71. It's the only thing left I haven't done, and then I can retire. And they said, whoa, all the no people came running out of the woodwork. You have to take an astronaut physical to fly that airplane because you're flying in 90,000 feet. That means if you flunk any part of that very difficult two-day physical, you will never fly again. And that's why people are afraid to go try out for that program. There's that word afraid. Well, I was 12. I was a 12-year-old by the time I got to this program. <laughs> Have you ever known a 12-year-old It was when you said, hey, maybe you shouldn't do that skateboard on the car? That said, yeah, boy, that's pretty dangerous. I don't think it will. They're already doing it. <laughs> I said, but what if I passed the physical and could actually fly that airplane? We would have missed it. And again, being surrounded by adults, I, they didn't get it. I scored the sixth highest score at Travis on their astronaut physical they had ever had. I was motivated. And internally, my body really was very strong. And they said, wow, you, you, you look like hell on the outside, but you're still strong. It's like, you, and then they were worried about scar tissue. And let me just tell you about scar tissue. It's, it's like leather. It's OK. It just You stretch it. It's actually tougher than skin. It's actually fine to fly with. You have to keep stretching and everything. So the Air Force was like so afraid. Then they said, well, you're wearing a space suit when you fly. And good God, we got to be breathing 100% oxygen all the time. And, and that could, you know, mess up your scar tissue. Yeah, they just didn't get it. <laughs> and I said, uh, I went into surgery 15 times, and they were giving me 100% oxygen every time. So I pretty much think it'll be OK. <laughs> what I learned in life as a 12-year-old in an adult world was that we become fearful we become, we, we lose our dream. We lose our passion. I was exactly the opposite. It didn't please everyone around me. And those that it did, you know, love you for life and say, thank you for reminding me what a gift each day is that isn't guaranteed. For those of you that are not familiar, this aircraft, the SR-71, stood for strategic reconnaissance, went globally. This was the airplane in that was invented because Gary Powers was shot down in 1960 over Russia. President Eisenhower was quite embarrassed. Went to Ke Kelly Johnson at Lockheed, said, build me an airplane they cannot shoot down. 18 months later, they rolled out the Blackbird, the SR-71, the fastest, highest flying jet ever built. We are cruising at 2,000 miles an hour uh, at 90,000 feet. And I could read your name tag if you were standing outside flying over at that speed. This airplane carried a crew of two, a pilot and a navigator, carried 80,000 pounds of fuel, about 16,000 gallons. We'd burn through in an hour and a half. It was made of titanium. You can't forge titanium. You can't use regular tools on titanium. That's why no one's ever built an airplane out of titanium, because it's too difficult and impossible to do. And they had a dream, and they did it. He said, we're going to invent technology in 1962 we're going to invent technology without computers to build an airplane. They hand-built each one. They only built 50 of these forever. And only about 35 were made the reconnaissance version. This airplane was your guardian of freedom of this nation for 26 years. It did more to shape your foreign policy from the Vietnam War to the Gulf War. It served six different presidents and did so many things behind the scenes that you never... All those pictures of Haiphong Harbor during the Huntley-Brinkley reports back in the 60s were shot, uh, pictures taken by this aircraft. There were no weapons on this airplane. Your only weapon was speed. In 26 years, not one was ever shot down. Not one piece of one jet was ever hit by any missile. Well ahead of its time, this was the jet that gave way to no other plane. Just up the road here in Marysville at Beale Air Force Base was the home of the most remarkable aircraft of the 20th century. People didn't know a lot about it because it was so top secret uh, that you, you couldn't say a lot about it. Uh, only, only later, when it started setting speed records in the 70s, just to thumb the, the nose at, this, at the Soviets, people became more aware of it. And uh, today, uh, people are still mesmerized by the fact that we could build an airplane in the 60s that as you're sitting here today in 2016, 
still holds every speed and altitude record. Well, I was crewed with Major Walter Watson. He's the one on the left. It was bad enough that I was getting all this uh, publicity in the Air Force as that burned up guy that's now flying the, the SR. Well, now Walter was the first and only African-American officer ever to be in this program. And what a brilliant engineer he was. What a terrific guy. We are best friends to this day. We flew for four years, every mission together. They team you up because the airplane requires that you work in tandem. You learn to work together in two totally different cockpits. Uh, we are, like I say, best friends to this day, and I had the best backseater in the squadron. When I got in the airplane, I checked out my cockpit. It looks pretty, pretty normal, pretty ancient. Here, you know what kind of uh, radar we had? We didn't have any radar. You know what kind of computers? That we, we didn't have any computers. You know what kind of flaps, spoilers, speed brake? We didn't have any of those things. The airplane was your basic street rod, 60s, go fast, burn gas airplane, and I loved it. Now, I got a little nervous. I saw no guns, bombs, or rocket switches. Felt a little naked. I thought, well, maybe I can flip a camera switch on. And it, nope. Walter had all the camera sensors, all the secret stuff in the back seat. I said, Walt, if we're ever shot down, you're the spy. I'm just the driver. <laughs> now, getting used to the space helmet did take a little, because as a fighter pilot in flight, you can take your oxygen mask off, uh, wipe sweat out of your eye, or if you're a Navy pilot, pick your nose, or whatever it is. <laughs> whatever it is they do. Um, but now you were entombed for five hours, six hours, whatever the mission was, they'd breathe in 100% oxygen and, and you'd get a little ear, earache later in the night when you came home. But, but you got thirsty, dehydrated, hungry, no big deal. I was a new guy and they were kind of playing with me on my first big mission. They said, hey, have the ham and cheese omelet at the in-flight. Don't do the steak and eggs today. Do the ham and cheese omelet and put extra cheese on there because you know, you're going to need that protein for that man. I thought, well, that makes sense. Cheese, protein, sure, pile it on. Now, those of you that know, as you go higher in elevation, the evolved gases in your body expand. <clears throat> well, passing 55,000 feet in the climb that day, I thought I was going to give live birth in the cockpit. <laughs> Walter's going, are you okay? Which I'm making sounds he's never heard. And, uh, Finally, at 72,000 feet, when relief came, I very tearfully realized how self-contained that entire uh, <laughs> environmental system was. Now, they worried about, I had two, I had a, a, a steel pin put in my finger here, but they built the hinge joint in. Had they not built the hinge joint into it, but on a whim, the doctor just said, well, why don't we just do that? He might want it someday. He's never going to fly again. Had they not done that, I would have never passed the physical. But because I could grip and grasp, which is what the reg said, but I had to learn to do some things upside down backwards in the cockpit. And you know, you will learn how to do something if you're motivated. I had the power of motivation and will on my side. You could learn as a 12-year-old, you could, you could do it if you want to do it bad enough. Now, I'll admit it's a lot more fun being in the front seat. Uh, you got a stick, you have a view. Walter had no way to fly the plane in the back. He's got his head down, working all the magic stuff. So here we are getting ready to go on a real mission. If you look closely at my spacesuit, ah, it's a little happy face. Kind of, yeah, well, this is fun. Walter's, ah, not so much. <laughs> Now, it may surprise you to know how few people we had in the squadron at any one time. We only had 15 guys in the squadron at any one time. We're out of the country six months out of the year. We only flew out of three locations and covered the globe all the time. Two jets in Okinawa, two jets in England, 10, 11 airplanes at Beale. That's it. That was it. Only 93 men in history flew this jet. And I always said I appreciated it more than the other 92. The photographs that you're seeing in today's presentation represent the world's rarest collection of Blackbird photos anywhere because they're all my own pictures. Now, you weren't allowed to carry a camera in certain areas. You couldn't do it, blah, 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 blah. But if you really wanted to get a photograph, you could get permission from the commander, go to the security chief, get the wing commander to sign off. It was a big hassle, but it could be done. And photography was my passion when I came out of the hospital. And what I say about living your dream, following your friends, don't miss the moment. So here I was with the most elegant aircraft ever built and carrying my camera out when I could. How was I going to miss that? In seven years, I only got 200 pictures. That's not a lot. That's not a lot. 
But that was the passion. Did I know I was going to be a speaker, write a book? Of course not. I just thought, how could you miss the moment of what this is? This is Okinawa Kadena. We're getting ready to go up to North Korea. Sonic boom their little shorts off. Um, <laughs> this airplane carried a double sonic boom at 2,000. Let me just give you a speed reference here. If you went hunting with your, your 30 out 6 rifle, that bullet exits the muzzle at 3,100 feet per second. This airplane would cruise with ease in a climb at 3,200 feet per second. Okay? We're doing a mile every two seconds or a mile every second and a half if you want to go a little faster. The jet would always go a little faster. Ronald Reagan knew how to use this airplane. He was our commander in chief. One day, the, uh, the, uh, all the bad guys were having a conference up in North Korea, and they invited all the Soviets and the Chinese, the Vietnamese, all the bad guys were there, and they didn't invite us. <laughs> Ronald Reagan said, hey, have Brian and Walter take off out of Kadena, go up to Korea, and fly a little figure eight, but and we're so we did this mission. We got and we said, what are we doing? We we have photographed the entire country in the first six minutes. It was Ronald Reagan's way of every six minutes sonic booming their coffee cup off the table, <laughs> just to let them know we know you're there, and now you know we're here, and you can't do a thing about it. Over 4,500 missiles were fired at this jet in 25 years. Not one was ever hit. Little footnote to history here: you may not know. Behind the jet is the Kadena Marina, where the Navy has a little officer's club where people are windsurfing and sailing and psh, learning how to windsurf. And rumor has it, and I, I don't know how true this is, but some SR-71 pilots on takeoff would like suck the wheels up 10 feet off the deck and full burner go ripping across that marina, knocking <clears throat> windsurfers over. And I think that's just a rumor, personally. <laughs> Now, I want you to be impressed with these pictures today, but I don't want you to be impressed with the photographer because the photographer knew nothing about photography except that he loved it and he had his Kodachrome slide film and had his little manual F3 camera and he was around the most beautiful lady in black that you would ever want to photograph. So it was a passion and it showed me. Now, when I look at this picture, that's a beautiful picture. That's a gloomy sky in England, getting ready to take off. The jet's running up one engine at a time. We're in the mobile car down the runway, mesmerized by the sound and fury that's going on in before us. Me and the commander are sitting in the mobile car, and he looks over, and he says, what's that camera doing on the seat? You know you're not supposed to have a camera out here. And then he looks back at the jet, because it just it captures our attention. And I'm like, huh, what, camera? And then I had to think fast. I go, you know, Colonel, if I got a picture of that, you could put that in your office while nobody would have that picture. <laughs> and as if not to be complicit, he never looked at me. He stared straight ahead at the jet, and I saw the little vein come out on his forehead. And his lips never moved exactly. But somehow I heard, you have 10 seconds. I will never forget this, because this, this, every time I see this picture, I can still feel the steel uh, buckle on the runway there where I'd put my knee in the hardness of the concrete and the cold of that, that, that England air, and I got two shots in 10 seconds, and I was still fumbling with my zoom lens, and I still couldn't figure out what the word aperture on the camera meant. I had no idea, <laughs> and I'm trying to roll it, and I'm thinking, what, it, it, did I expose it correctly? Did I get the wingtips in? I see that picture today and people go, ah, oh, it's National Geographic, man, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful because somebody didn't miss the moment, was not afraid to fail. Somebody just went for it because they were 12 and they didn't care if they failed, they weren't going to miss it. Because when they were laying on their back in the hospital, they were missing everything. They would have given their left toe to get out there and fail at something. I love that picture. Uh, moments later, the jet took off and did a big six-hour mission around the Russia and the Arctic Circle. If you never heard one of these take off, your life's incomplete, I'm sorry. Uh, this was not a sound you heard as much as the imitators. They are the real flyers. Well, no matter what else I do, as I said, I'm always going to be that guy. And people always say, well, I guess it doesn't get any better than that. You're fighting communism, flying the world's greatest jet. You studly man. You, you are the guy. You did it. And I go, yeah, that's very cool and everything. I, you got to realize I have other priorities in life. That's not the end all. That was one chapter of life. And I'd say that's number two of doesn't get any better than this. If you want my all time doesn't get any better than this moment in life, it would be the day 
They let me walk down those long concrete steps at Fort Sam Houston and leave the hospital. And there was a blue car waiting for me down, down below. And I abs walked down those steps with, on my own two legs without somebody helping me. And there was no therapist there to help me. I could open the car door even though it was painful. I didn't want the guy helping me. And I got back in the car and I was getting a second chance to go back to life. 30,000 men never saw the age of 21 died in Vietnam, never got to come home, never had a second chance, never had a life, never had their dreams fulfilled, and I was getting to start over. I was getting to go back and have a second redo. And I, I thought, that doesn't get any better than that. And isn't that all we can, we can ask in life is the opportunity? There was no guarantee when I went back to the Air Force that I'd fly well, I'd get to do it, half of the things I showed you today. No guarantee. All I wanted was the chance, the opportunity. And it's funny how we take our opportunities for granted so much every day. I remember having a squadron commander brief us one day and we were all bitching and moaning about how bad our job was. And a trash collector in San Francisco makes more money than a captain on flying status in a squadron. And it was true. Called us all in on a down day and said, okay, here's the deal. New York City, there are 10,000 doctors in one city, 10,000 doctors. He said, there's 4,000 Air Force fighter pilots in the whole world. He said, now, if you don't like your job, you don't want it. There's about a million guys at the door that will take your place. You know, it kind of puts some perspective. You want to be a trash collector in San Francisco, make that extra $200. Tell me right now, he says, you're out, you're gone. <laughs> and then the way he said it, we knew he meant it. And it just gave us a moment of perspective that, for me, this was a really great thing to do, but it wasn't the greatest thing. I will tell you, uh, before I close today, I will share this little story with you that uh, people always ask me, was it ever fun to fly the world's fastest jet? And, I, and I've shared this story many, many years ago, and it became, a, it became a cult classic on the internet, so people send it to me. And I go, hey, <laughs> I wrote it, it's in my book. I'm the guy. And they go, no, no, I heard this really incredible story. I go, hey, I, it's my story. So I'm going to tell you, because you will see it on the internet tonight when you, when you go on there. It's called the LA Speed Story. And I, it was just a story about one day it was really cool being, being an SR-71 pilot. Walter and I were doing a training mission around the United States where you just were building up hours and time. And we take off out of Beale, hit a tanker in Idaho, rip on up to uh, Montana, zip across Denver, hang a right turn in Albuquerque, out over Los Angeles, up to Seattle, back into Sacramento, two hours, 21 minutes. <laughs> and you just do that for, and then you do it backwards, and you hit a tanker, too. it was just, just to gain crew coordination, get, build your hours. We're on our last training mission, we're over Tucson, I can see downtown LA from Tucson. We're at 89,000 feet. I can see the whole western United States bathed in a warm October fall glow. I can see the chain of Rocky Mountains from Canada to New Mexico. I could, I could just see the most beautiful picture laid at my feet in the air as smooth as glass. Not a gauge moving in the cockpit. It was perfect. Now I'm thinking, we bad. <laughs> now I feel sorry for Walter because he has to monitor five radios in the back seat. So I flipped the switch up just to listen. and. LA Center is controlling, they control all, when you fly Southwest Air, the guy's controlling everybody. But we're above controlled airspace. So they, they have us on their scope, but they're not talking to us. Now there's controllers all over the country, Jacksonville Center, Chicago Center, Seattle Center, you know. It's the same guy. They all talk the same. And it's really cool the way they talk, because they make you feel important as a pilot. They don't just say, yeah, okay, here's your thing. They make you feel really cool. So sure enough, this was pre-GPS day. Some Cessna guy has to know his ground speed. Uh, LA Center Cessna in November Tangle Alpha. You got a ground speed readout for us? Now Center would like to say, who cares? Get off free. <laughs> but no, he'll talk to him like he's John Glenn. Cessna November Alpha, we show you 90 knots, nine zero knots on the ground. And they do that sing song, but that's how they talk. And it makes you feel kind of cool. Right after that, a twin bonanza came up to pimp the guy for speed, I guess. And, LA Center, Twin Beach, uh, whatever. You got a ground speed readout for us? And Center likes it. God, it's Friday. Why me? God, please, just get off. Free. But he's going to talk to him like he's Air Force One. Twin Beach, we show you 121, two zero knots on the ground. And right after that, a Navy F-18 out of Lemoore popped up on frequency. 
And you knew it was a Navy guy because he talked really slick on the radio. <laughs> Center Dusty 5-2 speed check. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Dusty 5-2 has a ground speed indicator and that million dollar F-18 cockpit. It's right there in the heads up display. Why is he calling Center to broadcast his speed? <laughs> uh, I get it. We are just the meanest, baddest, fastest military jet in the valley today. We're taking our little Hornet jet over Mount Whitney and ripping across Death Valley. And we want everyone from Fresno to the coast to know what real speed is. And you can almost hear a little, a little glee in the controller's voice like, we have put an end to this. <laughs> Dusty 5-2, we show you 620, 620 knots across the ground. And it was that across the ground. See that little knife like, I hope nobody else has the nerve to get on frequency now. And there wasn't an airliner from Seattle to San Diego that wanted to be next on Freak. It's sort of an etiquette thing amongst flyers. And a 12-year-old was reaching for the mic button. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, wait, Walter's in charge of the radios. I flew single seat all those years, but I'm in the family model now. And I, I wanted, no, it's the Navy that must die and it must die now. And I, and I thought, no, but if I do, I, well, I'll upset Walter and I want us to be a good crew. And I, at that moment, I heard a click of the mic button in the back seat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Walter and I became a crew at that moment. <laughs> in his best innocent voice, LA Center, Aspen 30, have you got a <laughs> ground speed readout for us? <laughs> you could almost hear a collective gasp on Freak, like, oh, the poor fools didn't hear the previous transmissions. Oh, they, they got crushed like a grape. It's, it's just a pilot thing. But Center had to give you that same voice. Aspen 30, we show you 1,992 knots <laughs> across the ground. When I knew I was going to like Walter a lot is when he came back and said, Center, we're showing a little closer to 2,000. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we did not hear another transmission on that frequency <laughs> all the way to the coast. The king of speed lived, the navy had been flamed, and a crew had been formed. For just a moment, it was absolutely fun being the fastest guys on the block. So what do combat hard and commie fight and fighter pilots do when they retire? I shoot pansies now, and I'm <laughs> very proud of that. I'm opening a gallery in Marysville of my nature photography and my jet stuff. Now there's an eclectic mix. So our motto is, are you ready for this? From butterflies to blackbirds, okay? So yeah, it's pretty good. Only took us two years to come up with that. Another two years, and we finally developed a, a logo, um, <laughs> which we think is pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And we're out, Gallery One has been in the works for 10 years now. We're not quite done, but we've renovated an old 100-year-old building up there. And everybody will know when it's done, because we'll put it in the paper. I'm going to close with a little special treat here for you today, since I have this incredible, uh, nice audiovisual setup here. One, I'd like to say before I show you this little film, Many of you get what I'm saying today. Make the most of each day. Don't miss your opportunity. Life is short. God, live it. Pursue your passion. Don't wait. You, you get it. And you're going to come up against a situation where you don't see a way around it, over it, through it. But you need, know you need to get to the other side, and you cannot see a way around You don't even understand why it's happening. When you meet that obstacle, just remember this little story. That one day, an SR-71 at Kadena Air Base took the runway out of taxiway alpha there, Rolled down the runway, sat there for 30 seconds, waiting for its appointed takeoff time. As it sat there, just dripping and oozing all the pilot. That day, could look out his little window on a 153 degree heading for 2.6 miles. He could see the roof of the hospital he'd laid in 12 years earlier. Legend has it that on takeoff that day, SR-71, instead of climbing straight out to the South China Sea to hit the tanker, made a hard 90 left turn at the end of the runway full burner, 250 feet. Some say much lower. <laughs> Buzzed a certain soccer field, sending kids screaming and falling down and crying and throwing the ball and <laughs> running for their life. Rattled every window in a certain hospital without breaking one. And as that big black jet made an arc back to course now that the entire base was awake, it was as if all things had come full circle for that pilot that day. For the first time he could realize some of the reasons 
and understand better the events that had transpired in his life that he could not possibly fathom while they were happening. He realized at that moment that when Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge, that it was indeed true and that the sky uh, was truly not the limit. So for all of you that said you knew the words, I'd like to conclude with a little special treat for you. SR-71 flew from Palmdale, California to the Smithsonian Museum in 64 minutes, setting eight official speed records before they put the jet to bed. I want to thank you for allowing me to come and share a little bit of this ancient technology with folks who are working on cutting edge. I'd like to thank my audiovisual crew. That was excellent. I'd like to thank Melissa for inviting me to come, I'd like to thank my mom and dad for supporting every dream their wild kid ever had. Don't miss the moment. Joy every day. I will sit at my table as long as uh, any of you like have questions or like to see the book or a coin. We're supporting Wounded Warrior today. It's a treat for me to be in this prestigious facility. I, I've toured about every one of the other top secret places, and this is one of the last uh, few. So you, I didn't know what to expect. It's just been a terrific audience. I gave you a little extra day. You had a few extra stories. I'm sorry if I cut into your, your lunch. I'm sure the food here is just spectacular. <laughs> um, so I'll let you get back to your important work, and, and, uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. can 